Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Eric Lopez from the University of Edinburgh. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, how I. Um, formerly of Santa Cruz, where I did my PhD, I'm now a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh, as you rightly note, on a uh, EU grant. Uh, fortunately, I did get an email this morning. I am not out of a job. I, I do still have money for, uh, it's not going away. However, uh, let's see, is this the clicker or is, sorry, I should have asked that sooner. Uh, oh, no, no, I just got the laser pointer. Yes. All right. Ah, OK. I, I can just use the arrow as well. OK. Sorry. I, can you tell I'm a theorist? OK. So yes. Yeah. So obviously, uh, this, was, this was not a happy day uh, for me. Uh, if any of the uh, Brits in the audience are in need, I did bring a nice bottle of Dalwini with me from Scotland. So come see me later. But hopefully, I think I can distract you for at least a couple minutes with what I think is some fairly exciting science. Uh, so later in the meeting, I think I'll actually talk a bit about the inflated hot Jupiters. But mostly, what I work on are the hot, uh, short period, uh, low mass planets and trying to understand their evolution, particularly with evaporation, as we've heard a lot about this week. So just a quick outline. I'm going to start with just a quick bit of background and motivation on super Earth, sub Neptunes, and evaporation. We've already heard quite a bit about these planets, but I want to sort of talk about broad strokes of what are the general features of this population um, and what can evaporation, how we can use evaporation as a tool to understand this population in general. Then I'll go just a little bit into how we model planet uh, evolution to take into account for this physics. And then I'm going to focus in particular on a, what I think is a very interesting and useful population of planets, the ultra short period planets. These are the newly discovered planets that have orbital periods of less than a day or so. And I think these planets are incredibly useful. And then finally I'll talk I'll describe quickly some results from, from some evaporation models I've run um, that I'm hopefully about to uh, submit and then discuss the implications for planet formation. So I think from the Kepler mission, one of the most important things we got is an idea of, for the first time really, of how common different sizes of planets are. So this is the uh, corrected occurrence rate, corrected for selection effects for planets within about 85 days. So for non-astronomers, this is about the orbit of Mercury. And this is planet radius compared to the Earth. So for comparison, Earth is down here. Uh, Neptune is about fourth radii up here. Uh, here you can see the occurrence rate. So giant planets close in, while very fascinating, are quite rare. But then once you get below about the size of Neptune, planets become incredibly common. And the big question is, okay, down here, we all hopefully have some idea of what an Earth-like planet could potentially be like. We have at least one good example for that. And we have two examples in the solar system of what a Neptune-sized planet can be like. But what on Earth are these things in between? These are called super-Earths and uh, sub-Neptunes. We know from follow-up work that somewhere at around one and a half Earth radii, you find a transition between bare rocky planets and non-rocky planets. As James was uh, saying earlier, planets that just from their densities alone have to have a massive, massive gaseous envelope. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about an atmosphere. I'm talking about things that make up a significant component of the bulk density of the planet. So I think the, one of the key questions is going to be asking, what on Earth can that bulk component be? I, Jonathan showed uh, this figure on Monday. Uh, so don't worry too much about the actual uh, data at the moment. That's what all of these points. I've sized them inversely to their precision. So these are sort of, as of right now, this is our, is our population of low mass plants that we have good masses for. But it, as Jonathan pointed out, there's this interesting degeneracy where down here you have the bare rocky planets. 
Up here you have the sub-Neptunes that have to have large volatile envelopes, but there's a degeneracy. They can have a 1% hydrogen helium solar composition envelope, and that can explain their size. But they could also have a significant water steam envelope that is, say, half, 70, 80 percent of their mass, and you get a planet with roughly about the same size. So it's two wildly different compositions, but from mass and radius alone, it's impossible to distinguish between them. And of course, this has huge implications for planet formation. Uh, of course, as we, we all know from Planet Formation 101, uh, if something contains large amounts of water ices, then it probably formed very far out, uh, or at least some of its material formed very far out beyond the snow line, and then we had to migrate in. Remember, I'm talking about planets that are on less than 85-day orbits. A lot of these, in particular, I'm going to be talking about planets on one-day orbits. So if they are large amounts of water, that means the, these planets could not have formed in situ. They had to migrate a huge amount. On the other hand, if the, these are just scaled-up Earths, if they're just sca scaled-up Earths that, in some cases, have a bit of a hydrogen envelope, then you can imagine f them forming closer in situ. And this is a very important distinction. It has huge implications for habitability, for Eta Earth, for all sorts of issues. So that's what I want to try and address. Uh, I think going about that, evaporation is a really useful tool for trying to break degeneracies in planet composition. Because of course, as we've heard several times this week, if you take a planet with a gaseous envelope, you stick it on a one-day orbit, you're going to get a huge amount of evaporation. And now for gas giants planets, as is pictured here, I think Andrew also had this very nice artist conception on his title slide, you get a, this huge cloud of gas coming off in Lyman Alpha that can be observable. But if you're hot Jupiter, you may be losing an Earth mass a gig a year. Well, you've got 300 Earth masses to spare. What do you care? It's, it's a, amazing. It's observation. It constrains a lot of physics, but it doesn't really affect the planet. On the other hand, if you're a sub-Neptune and you only had maybe a tenth of an Earth mass to begin with, then you're talking about transforming the planet. You can take a sub-Neptune, put it on a one-day orbit, and you strip it away. And all you're left with is this burnt-out rocky husk of its former self. And so what that means is that the compositions we measure today, at billions of years later, do not equal the compositions at formation. But that evaporation is going to depend on what the planet is made of. So I'm going to try and use that evaporation to break that those sorts of degeneracies. We have really nice observational evidence that I think is very suggestive of this population has been on the whole, strongly sculpted by evaporation. Uh, I think we saw this figure on uh, Monday and then again later in the week. Here I've just plotted what is the total XUV energy planets have received, uh, integrated over their lifetime uh, with some nominal scaling relations, mostly for sun-like stars, versus the planet's binding energy today. This, uh, I've color-coded the planets by what their composition is today. So these rust-colored planets are meant to be bare rock, hence why I tried to color them vaguely rust. Uh, and then all the rest of the planets are things with gaseous envelopes. So the idea is here's, here's the energy in, here's the energy you have. Therefore, there should be some sort of, if evaporation is going on, there should be some sort of a threshold in this figure. And, you know, chi by i, that's what I see when I look at this. I see a nice threshold above which you do not find planets. You do not, for example, find planets that are two Earth radii, uh, sorry, two Earth masses and five Earth radii that are on a one day orbit. Those don't exist. Those would be up here. You do find these uh, bare, burnt out, rocky worlds on one day orbits. And you do, by the way, down here, this is where the super puffs live. Interestingly, uh, I, I first made this figure, I think, in my third year of grad school, and I keep tr uh, updating it regularly. The super puffs keep piling up right on the threshold, which always I, I find very interesting. Uh, but I think overall this paints a convincing picture that evaporation has been very important. Just for uh, 
those who are curious, I think this is very relevant to Laura's project. Uh, this is where the M dwarfs lie. Uh, this version of the figure is a little bit older. This is from my thesis. So you'll notice a couple of planets uh, disappeared. But this is GJ1214. This is uh, 3470. And this is 436. Uh, for reference, uh, more recently, this is where GJ1132 uh, would lie. And if you assume they're rocky, Trappist uh, 1, B, and C would also lie about there. And so there's this interesting observation that if you look at the planets around mid to late M dwarfs, where the stars are much more active, sample size of six, but they seem to be more vulnerable to evaporation than this population defined by sun-like stars. So just, it's just a, a modest suggestion that I, I think is, but is still very suggestive and really motivates some projects like what Laura is working on. So OK, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of the model. I'm happy to take questions later. Um, and for the full details, you can take a look at our 2012 or 2014 papers. But the basic idea is you take a model of how the planet e uh, evolves thermally in time and how it loses its mass over time, and you couple the two together. So this is the thermal evolution. This is just basically your standard stellar structure evolution model. You have some interior entropy. You want to know how that involves in time. So you model the radiative transfer uh, through the atmosphere, or you get Jonathan to do it for you. And then you, if you're a low mass planet that 90% of your mass is in the core, you probably need to move, uh, model the radioactive heating and the cooling of that core as well. And that's basically all, all that goes in there. There's a lot of details, but the end story of this is you can then predict for a given planet mass and age and level of radiation and composition how large a planet should be under the influence of thermal evolution. And then you go and you combine that with a model of planet evaporation. Uh, for today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, looking at two different mass loss regimes. So uh, Ruth mentioned earlier in her talk, there's this energy limited regime, which is generally valid for things that are sort of moderately irradiated, the things that sort of tens of day periods. When you get to these one day periods, you have to worry about uh, radiation recombination cooling. And so you enter a different regime. Uh, this is from uh, Ruth's 2009 paper. I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to compute both of these mass loss rates, and then I'm just going to take whatever is lower. And that does a pretty good job of, at least for planets sort of on tens of day orbits and less for solar atmospheres, modeling uh, this sort of full behavior. OK, now uh, there's one other caveat I want to point out. All of this evaporation happened very early, as James is talking about. It's always important to remember the sun was a factor of 100 uh, brighter in the extreme UV and x-rays when it was less than 100 million years old than it is now. When you combine that with the fact that planets' radii were much larger when they were young, because of course they still have all of that heat from formation, that means almost all of the evaporation happens when the, during a planet's first 100 million years. And today we're just seeing the aftermath of that train wreck. So now I just I sort of want to jump right into the results. So I have this evaporation model. You can run a giant suite of models. And what that allows you to do is to predict where planets should end up in terms of their radius and their envelope fraction as a function of irradiation. So this is just a giant suite of models I've run. The thing I want you, the colored points of the individual models color coded by their uh, envelope fractions. The thing I want you to pay attention to is this grayscaling. That's telling you where the models pile up. So where it's darker, more models. So over here, you have the population of the sub-Neptunes that still have a gaseous envelope. Down here, you have the stripped rocky superts. Here, I've assumed everything has some initial envelope. I'll, I'll, I'll assume it's a power law distribution, but everything starts with an accreted envelope. And you make the, the rocky superts by stripping them. Interestingly, you'll note in between here, you have a bit of a gap. This is the so-called evaporation valley, which ask me about later. I think it's very interesting. Uh, but I wanna, I'm running out of time, so I want to jump straight into the ultra-short period planets, because I think these are incredibly useful. So th this is from a uh, 
Nature paper from earlier this year by Lundquist. Uh, this was noticed uh, earlier than that by Roberto Sanchez Ojeda. There's this interesting observation that if you look at the planets within uh, orbits less than one day, they're all consistent with being rocky to first order, with maybe one exception. Uh, they're pretty much all consistent with being rocky between for the planets less than about fourth radii. There just aren't sub-Neptunes on orbits less than one day. And this is, of course, what you might expect if planets formed with a hydrogen helium envelope. Hydrogen helium envelopes are incredibly vulnerable to photoevaporation. So you stick them on a one-day orbit, they're just going to get ripped apart. If you try and make them so massive they can resist that, they'll tidally uh, fall onto the star. So this is that same uh, figure I was showing you earlier of the distribution of radius versus flux, but I've shifted to higher radiation. So here for comparison is one day. And what you'll notice is basically you don't, very, very, very few planets survive with hydrogen helium envelopes. Basically almost, I think I ran about 10,000 models to make this, and basically everything ends up rocky. However, and this is the key caveat, this is not true if you talk about planets with steam atmospheres. If you have a, I'm going to go to the other limiting case. No hydrogen helium, it's just a pure steam atmosphere. In that case, planets are very uh, resi uh, resilient against evaporation. And this doesn't even really matter what exactly evaporation prescription you use. A lot of this is just because the thermal evolution of a steam envelope, the radius doesn't change anywhere near as much in time. And so this makes a clear prediction that if the ultra-short period planets were mostly forming from material that came from beyond the snow line and was very water rich, then there should be a large population of them that are still, would have retained their steam atmospheres and are over two Earth radii. And that is not what we see. And I think, yes, and here are my conclusions. I think, Tad, are you sure? Okay, sorry. Sorry, Tad? Uh, when you were showing the results of the big grid, were you showing the results of the big time? Yes, sorry. So that is, that is at five giga years. It doesn't, once, once you're beyond a couple hundred million years, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, that was at nominal age of the solar system. It, it, they reach a steady state envelope fraction. The radius continues to contract a little bit, but that's just from the thermal evolution. Uh, I think I saw George first, and then Mike. Yeah, so one key here is, uh, in this figure, I'm only including the steady state uh, XUV heating. This is really what, there have been a big uh, effort with HST STIS and with things like Chandra and XNM to constrain the high energy heating for sun-like stars and to some extent down to about M2 or so. But we get, STIS observations are of course expensive, so they don't want you to stare at a single star for a year to see how it's varying. So usually we just get a quick snapshot and we get some idea of what the steady state uh, um, emission is. And it roughly seems to follow a similar power law from Early, uh, from uh, early M to late F or so. Um, this does not account for flares. And I think that could be what's going on here. Because once you get around mid M drawers, that's going to be very important. Uh, I think Mike first. Uh, yes, I, I am very interested in 55K3. I've thought a lot about this. If you put a hydrogen helium atmosphere, and I think James can back me up on this, it's gone instantly, within a million years. It cannot retain to a hydrogen helium atmosphere. It's really weird. It's, I, I don't understand how it can be a bare rocky planet. It should be a water envelope, I think. But then how do you explain what's going on with the variability and the day nights, if, if, if I tr and to trust observers. Yeah. It's, I, I, I'm curious to talk about, we can talk about this more later. I don't know what to make of it. 
Uh, but no, it cannot, 55 canker E cannot hold on to a hydrogen helium atmosphere. Uh, I think Daniel and then James. Oh, yeah, it will. Be, um, before, before the evaporation happens, it, which it, I think the evaporative wind Ruth showed is generally launched at around a uh, nanobar, down at about the microbar level or so, you've already uh, further dissociated the water. But the, the dissociative heating isn't anywhere near as intense as the ionizing heating. So the, the, it's the ionizing heating that really does the work to remove material. Thank you. Yeah. James? Uh, so for that, I think I used uh, Eugenia Skolnick and Travis Barman. Uh, they, they had uh, some relations. The, the caveat is we have good observations of the FUV flux, I believe, and the X-rays. We don't really know what the EUV is doing, so the standard thing is just to assume it scales the same way uh, with stellar type and age. So that's, that, that's what I did, uh, sort of basically using the same sort of relation uh, that is applicable for uh, early M and sun-like stars. Uh, you do get a little bit of enhancement because what's actually constant is the bol XUV to bolometric ratio. And you get a lot of evolution in the bolometric luminosity because the pre-main sequence lifetime is so much longer. So that, 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 that does give you an enhancement. I include that. Thank Eric again. All right.